But over the last few studies, we've, we've really come, hopefully, to meet a man who Christ handpicked to take for a very specific critical mission, and a mission that Christ prepared him for, to extend the truth to the Gentiles and to take the gospel unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And we've watched as Christ has taken him on that journey of development, that, that journey of discovery, to convert him from being the truth's greatest adversary and opponent to being Christ's greatest advocate and activist for the truth. And, and just think about the things that we've covered over the last, um, last few studies, really. We've witnessed the truth being flashed before him in that blinding light on the road to Damascus. We've followed him down that, to that sheltered cave in Arabia where Christ opened unto him and expounded to him the scriptures concerning Messiah and the law and the prophets. And then we've watched him as Christ began him on his missionary journey to come face to face with the old self in Cyprus, which completely revolutionized, but he basically changes from Saul of Tarsus to become Paul the Apostle as he is born, as he takes off to preach the truth without self-regard and complete self-abandonment as, as he realizes who he'd been and what he'd done. After he came face to face with the mirror experience of Alamus the sorcerer and Christ sees in him the old Saul of Tarsus. And so we've seen him change, haven't we, from that self-important, arrogant Pharisee into the selfless, humble servant of his Lord who Christ crafted to suffer and endure many things for the truth's sake. And so tonight, what we want to see is we want to come back full circle. We want to step back and we want to have a look at the journey that Christ took him on. Because we want to just see we really want to see what Christ had prepared him for, what he actually suffered, and what he actually experienced during his life. And what we want to do as we do that is not just go, wow, look at what the Apostle Paul suffered. What we want to do is also see and understand the secret to the Apostle Paul's ability to endure all of these unspeakable and unbelievable persecutions and sufferings and yet still be happy and zealous and even more passionate for the truth through all his suffering. We want to try and unlock the secret to the Apostle Paul's ability to endure persecution. You know, it's safe to say that the Apostle Paul was definitely haunted by his persecuting past. There's no doubt about that. He absolutely was haunted and he was reminded of his persecuting past. Come and have a look with me in 1 Corinthians and chapter 15. I want to show you that this was on his mind at all times. You know, it's sort of something you can't get away from as you think about your life and your background, if you're Paul the Apostle. Nobody sees in 1 Corinthians and chapter 15 and verse 8. Writing to the Corinthians, he says, Verse, verse 7, after, after that he was seen of James and then all the apostles. And then verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 15. And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that I'm not really meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the ecclesia of God. And you see, the, the, the apostle Paul was haunted by his persecuting past through every day of his life as he remained in the truth and as he preached the gospel. Now he says, I'm not meant to be called an apostle, really, because I, I persecuted the very ecclesia of God that I was trying to preach and say at the ultimate parts of my life. But I don't believe that it was that that drove him. I don't believe it was the guilt and the, the, the agony and the memory of that experience that drove him. Because you keep reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because look what he says. But by the grace of God, he says, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. 
yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. And so the question we have to ask ourselves was, well, what was it that motivated him? Sure, it was his persecuting past that he was haunted by, because it was something he would never be able to delete from his memory. The persecution and the stoning of Stephen stayed with him right until the end of his life. We know that because he quotes it in Second of Timothy chapter 4. But the thing that drove the Apostle Paul was not the memory, was not the agony, was not the guilt of his persecutions. The motivating factor was actually the understanding and the appreciation of the grace of God that had bestowed upon him. It was the appreciation and of the blessing of undeserved divine favor and mercy that drove him every single day of his life. And you know, the Apostle Paul, as he went on about through his life, lived on grace time. You see, the Apostle Paul knew that he had been saved by grace. He knew that he would that, that grace had worked in his life. There he says in 1 Corinthians, I labor more abundantly than they all, but not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Come and have a look in Galatians chapter 2, because he says a very similar thing to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 2. You see, the apostle Paul learned that it was the grace of God that had saved him. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. He says, or verse 19, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. He says, and do you know what? He says, I am co-crucified. I'm crucified with Christ. But somehow I live. But it's not me, he says. Yet not I, but Christ which lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Therefore, he says, verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And you see, the Apostle Paul knew and understood that he'd lived by grace. That the grace of God had saved him. Do you know what's remarkable when you really put the story of the Apostle Paul living on grace time? Was we know Galatians chapter 1 verse 15, it says that he was called by grace. Galatians 1 verse 15. He was saved by grace in Acts chapter 9 verse 10. The man Ananias that had come, that, that put his hands on him and appointed him to the ministry on behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. His name meaning the grace of God. He was a man, as, we, as we'll find, as motivated by grace as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 1. He's, we see in Acts 20 verse 24 that he taught and he, gave it, he gives the gospel a label. He says it's the gospel of grace. And you know what's remarkable, brothers and sisters and young people, when you look at how grace is used in terms of the, the writers when they wrote their epistles. James uses the word grace five times. Peter uses it twelve times. John uses it once. Jude uses it once. In Revelation, John in Revelation uses it once. But Paul, sure, he wrote a lot of epistles. But Paul uses the word grace in his epistles 110 times. Do you think it was a motivating factor in the Apostle Paul's life? Well, you betcha it was. And every epistle bar one begins grace, mercy, and peace. And but every epistle does end, the grace of God be with you all. You see, the thing that motivated the Apostle Paul in his life in the truth, and what really drove him and inspired him, was a deep appreciation, a deep understanding of God's grace. You know, we're going to have a look at what that really meant for Paul shortly. Because I think sometimes we say, yeah, yeah, we understand that the, the grace of God saved him. And that, that the grace of God saves us. Yes, but it actually means something quite practical. And we're going to have a look at that um, shortly. But you know what's remarkable, brothers and sisters and young people, is, is that in Paul's case, 
This grace wasn't something that he came to realize by himself. This is not something that he it dawned on him that, oh, that's what it is. I've been saved by grace. Of course I have. No, no, no. It's something that the Apostle Paul was taught, was shown, and was instructed. It was something he had to learn. And who did he have to learn it from? And who taught him? And the answer is, it was from the Lord himself. Come and have a look in First of Timothy in chapter 1. Here's who taught him that he'd been saved by grace. First of Timothy in, in chapter 1. Look what he says to Timothy in verse 11. So he says this. And, and he's talking about um, the, the commandment of him and what, what, he, what he does. Knowing this, that the law is not made for the righteous, etc., etc., right? And it was made according to the glorious gospel, verse 11, of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. He said, something was given to me for my trust. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me or empowered me for that he counted me faithful and he put me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and an injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Jesus Christ. And so you see, Paul was taught and inspired about what his apostleship was all about. And what did he learn? Verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all expectation that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. This is what, I, this is what he learned. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. What for? For a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. You see, Paul was taught and inspired to understand why Christ had called him. Do you know, remember what Acts chapter 9 verse 16 said? Acts chapter 9 verse 16, Ananias says, Christ says to Ananias, For I will show him. Notice that's a really important word. I'm going to show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. You see, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ taught Paul before he endured these sufferings what he would suffer. And Paul in, in, in 1 Timothy says, do you know why? Why did Christ show me about all of that? He said, because I was going to be taught by Christ so that I might be a living demonstration of the mercy of God and what the forgiveness of sins was all about. That's why I'm here. And through Paul, Christ wanted to show that God could forgive all, regardless of background. That in me, says Paul in verse 16, in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering as a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Do you know what is interesting about that, brothers and sisters, is because I think sometimes we don't fully appreciate what the grace of God can do for us. Do you know, I hear often from either young people or sometimes old people, God can't work with me. God can't help me. I've got a bad background. I'm, I'm useless. I can't do anything for God. I'm hopeless. My background haunts me. Do you know, there's a lesson for us in the life of the Apostle Paul. That even in our lowest ebb of our life and our spiritual journey, brothers and sisters, you cannot say, if Christ could save a murderer, that he can't work with you and me. You see, what Paul is saying, brothers and sisters, is as if God can work with him, he can work with us.
You see, because God, the Apostle Paul, wanted everybody to know, not just because of his persecuting past, but because God was going to demonstrate through him the extremity of his long suffering, his forgiveness, as a pattern for anybody who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. You know, there's no reason why God can't work with us if we don't, if we, if we just, God can work with us if we just allow him. You see, Christ was going to make him suffer great things to demonstrate that point. He was going to suffer many things at the hands of Christ's enemies to show just how long suffering God could be. Do you know what's remarkable, brothers and sisters and young people, when you detail out the Apostle Paul's sufferings? No one suffered for the period of time that the Apostle Paul did. No one suffered, I believe, the extremities of the sufferings of Paul and the way that Paul suffered. You know, sometimes when you actually look at and you list out the Apostle Paul's sufferings like we're about to do, it's impossible to see how he continued to live, let alone function, let alone be positive, let alone write epistles of magnificent quality to the believers, except through the grace of God. Do you know, Come and have a look in 2 Corinthians in, in chapter 11. I'm going to, let's detail out the sufferings that Paul endured. The pattern on which he was going to demonstrate the long suffering of God. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We know this passage well. But I want to read it and I want you to really appreciate the weight of the sufferings of Paul. 2 Corinthians in chapter 11 verse 23. He says, look, are they ministers of Christ? You know, I speak as a bit of a fool, really. He says, because I am more of a minister. He says, let's just talk about the ministry that I go through in terms of having to suffer. Notice verse 20, suffering and bondage and being smitten in the face. He says, look, I know what that's like. He says, verse 23, let's just list out a few things that I've had to endure over the last period of time. He says, in labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, oft. Of the Jews, five times received thy forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of the waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, and in perils amongst false brethren. He says, and the list just carries on. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst and fastings oft, in cold and nakedness. And above all that, besides all this, he says... The thing that are without, that which cometh upon me every day of my life. He says, the burden of the care of all the ecclesias. Let's just talk about the sufferings of Paul. Paul's not boasting, brothers and sisters. He's just trying to demonstrate the extremity of the sufferings that he had extended. That he could talk with credibility. You see, the Apostle Paul had painful memories Cruel persecutions, debilitating illnesses, vicious punishments, soul-destroying shipwrecks, physical exhaustion, perilous passages, nutritional deprivation, stressful concerns every single day of his life. And you know what's remarkable about that, brothers and sisters? He's writing in 2nd of Corinthians in chapter 11 at year 20 of his 32-year ministry. He still had 12 years to go. There was still 12 years of suffering that the Apostle Paul would um, would experience before the axe fell on the hoary head of the Apostle Paul on the cobblestones of the back street in Rome. Just what did he suffer? 
for the truth's sake, for Christ's sake, brothers and sisters. It's enormous. You know, when you, when you just look at Acts, and you list as you go through the story of Acts, the things that he endured, his life was threatened to Damascus in Acts 9. His life was threatened again in Jerusalem in Acts 9, and later in Acts 9. He's persecuted and run out of Antioch. He faces stoning in Iconium. He is stoned and left for dead in, in Lystra. He's opposed and made the center of a major controversy um, he's in Acts 15. He's, he's the strife and, and he loses his close traveling companions in, in, in Barnabas in Acts 15. He's beaten with rods and imprisoned in Philippi. He's cast out and driven as an exile from Philippi. His life is threatened in Thessalonica. He's forced out of Berea. He's mocked in Athens. He's brought before the judgment seat in Corinth. He's opposed by the entire industry of the silversmiths in Acts 18. He's opposed uh, he's plotted against by the Jews in Greece. He's mobbed and his life is endangered in Jerusalem. He's arrested and detained in Rome in a prison. He barely escapes being scourged in Acts 22. He's then rescued from Sanhedrin mob action in Acts 23. He's imprisoned for another two years in Caesarea. He's then shipwrecked and barely escapes with his life in Acts 27. He's then bitten by an island viper in Acts 28 and imprisoned again in Rome in Acts 28. And so when he writes at the end of his life to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 11 to 12, he says, But you've fully known my doctrine. You know my manner of life. You know my purpose. You know my faith, my long-suffering, my love, my patience, my persecutions, my afflictions, which came to me at Antioch and Iconia and Lystra. Which persecutions, he says, I endured. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that would live godly will suffer persecution. Oh, Timothy knew the suffering that Paul endured. But the point is this, brothers and sisters, is that the Apostle Paul had been taught, he'd been told what those sufferings would be and what he would incur as Christ's representative before he suffered. Did you know, he'd been taught more than that, hadn't he? The Apostle Paul had been taught more than just what he would suffer. The Apostle Paul had also been taught why he would suffer. You see, the Apostle Paul was going to have an extra burden put upon his shoulders by the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to suffer all of these things, but I want you to also know why you're going to suffer them. And the reason I believe that he was shown this was because the Apostle Paul, what Christ is going, was going to reveal to the Apostle Paul that he was actually fulfilling Scripture. Just like Christ understood that his suffering would fulfill Scripture. So likely in Arabia did Christ take the Apostle Paul through the law and the prophets. And he opened unto him his mind to enable him to see. He opened to him the power and the structure of the law and all its types and its shadows. Sure. He opened unto him the wisdom and the beauty of the Psalms and its understanding of Messiah. Yes. But he also opened unto him the insights and the prophecies that the prophets had foresaw as the role of Christ to suffer great things. And we know one of the prophecies, and we don't have time to do it and look at it tonight, but we know one of the prophecies that was that Christ definitely showed Paul was the servant songs of Isaiah. And I believe what he showed, showed Paul, brothers and sisters and young people, is, is how he would become and how he would represent Christ to the Gentiles as the suffering servant of Isaiah. You know, I think he spent time, brothers and sisters, to show Paul that although Christ had come, that although Christ had fulfilled in part his role as the suffering servant, that ultimately it was Christ and Paul together that would complete the fulfillment. Because the suffering servant required the gospel of grace to be delivered unto the Gentiles, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Something Christ had achieved in his life. And so Christ in Arabia 
showed Paul that the role that he was going to portray was Christ to the Gentiles. That together, as Paul and Christ, they might fulfill all righteousness. And just look what he showed him. You know, it would be almost arrogant of Paul to quote the servant songs like he does without Christ showing him this. You know, Paul quotes the servant songs about himself all the time. He says, that's me, that's me, that's me. Look what he says. Isaiah 42. And this, I um, thank Brother Roger for this stuff because um, from a CYC camp years ago. It's important to take your notes and chuck it in your Bible because it comes back to help you. So, because we don't have time to do it, I'm going to use his summary. So, um, Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 7, the first suffering, uh, first servant song, talks about the, the servant being subject to trial and labor, but patient. The second servant song in, in Isaiah 49 talks about the servant subject to weariness and scorn, but persevering. In Isaiah 50, the third servant song, we find the servant subject to hostility and abuse, and yet he's determined to fulfill his role. And we see the fourth servant song in Isaiah 42 and 40, uh, 52 and 53, subject to violence and death, but ultimately triumphant. You see, we know Christ showed that he would be the ultimate fulfillment of these servant songs because Christ, uh, sorry, Paul quotes these servant songs as particularly referring and being applicable to him as his role as Christ to the Gentiles. You see, in the first servant song in Isaiah 42, he was going to be a chosen vessel unto God and a light unto the Gentiles. That's Acts 9. That's Acts 26. It's Galatians chapter 1. The very thing that Paul picked out of that servant song, he says, yeah, the chosen vessel, that's me, to be a light unto the Gentiles. He's talking about me. Second servant song in Isaiah 49, a suffering servant who takes the gospel to the ends of the earth. He quotes that in Acts 13, in Galatians chapter 1, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. That's me, he says. And the third servant song, what does he pick out of the third servant songs? Well, he talks about a resolute and preaching servant who is totally and utterly unmovable. So that's me. Romans chapter 8. You don't have time to turn all these things up, but take a note and, and have a look at them for yourself. And the final servant song in, in Isaiah 52 and 53, what does he pull out of the fourth servant song? He pulls out the fact that he's a witnessing servant to all, notice the expressions, that he had seen and that he had heard. You see, that's Acts 22. That's Romans 15. You see, I think, brothers and sisters and young people, that Christ in Arabia taught Paul not only about what he would suffer, but why he would suffer. And that his mission was to extend the work of Messiah and his gospel unto the Gentiles to be his personal witness and to suffer great things as Christ to them. But brothers and sisters and young people, although Christ taught Paul the fact that he would suffer and the fact that that he would, that, um, why he would suffer. He taught him more than that, didn't he? He also taught him how to endure. Come and have a look in Philippians in chapter 4. Look at the words that Paul carefully chooses to show us that this wasn't something that Paul arrived at on his own. Come and have a look in Philippians chapter 4, verse 10. Look what he says. He says, but, Philippians 4, verse 10, he says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now, at the last, your care of me hath flourished again. Wherein ye also were careful, but ye lacked opportunity. He says, but, but I, don't, I don't speak because I, I, in respect of want. I'm not 
I'm not talking to you because I, I need stuff, he says. No, I've, for, he says, I have, notice the word he chooses, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I have learned, it means to come to know by instruction. That's really what it means in the Greek. To come to know by instruction. And what had he learned? Well, he had learned by instruction that whatever state he might be in, I've learned to be content. He says, do you know what? He says, verse 12, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. I everywhere and in all things I've been instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Interesting expression, the word instructed. Rotherham translates that. I've been let into the secret, says Rotherham. How? What? I can do all things, he says, verse 13. Through Christ which strengtheneth me. He was taught where whatever state he might be in, he was to be content. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. You know, do you know the word in the Greek for strengthen, brothers and sisters? It's the word endunamo, where we get our English word endure. I can do all things through Christ, which helps me endure. You see, Christ showed and taught Paul not just what sufferings he would experience, not just why he would experience them, but also how he would endure these sufferings. And whatever his enemies might throw at him, brothers and sisters and young people, Paul was able to happily endure these persecutions for Christ because Christ had taught him and instructed him and led him into the secret as to how to overcome. And so here's the question. What's the secret that Christ let him on? What's the secret? What did Christ teach him in terms of his ability to endure Happy, endure with happiness the sufferings and the persecutions for Christ's sake. How did he do it? How did the Apostle Paul take everything his enemies threw at him on the chin and smile and become more passionate and more enduring for the truth? For 32 years of his life. Well, I don't think it's that much of a secret, brothers and sisters, because I think that the Apostle Paul was taken on the journey of the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Because what we're given a glimpse in Matthew chapter 5 to is how Christ overcame. And I believe, brothers and sisters, that the journey that the Apostle Paul was taken through is not secret. In fact, it's the Beatitude journey, the journey of faith we're all called to, to embark on. That we might overcome trials and sufferings and persecutions so that we too might endure and be happy for the truth. Come and have a look in Matthew chapter 5. And we're, we're going to close our, our sessions on the Apostle Paul by seeing just how the Apostle Paul was taken on the journey of the Beatitude. I want to show you something that's practical about these Beatitudes, brothers and sisters. Hopefully, this is not new to, to anyone, really. But, but in Matthew chapter 5, and, and verse 3, he tells them that the very first Beatitude is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And if you haven't noticed the expression, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, you've got to circle that word is, brothers and sisters and young people. Because the Beatitudes start and the Beatitudes finish with that expression. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Look at in verse, look in verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
And so the Beatitudes, brothers and sisters, are enveloped in this expression, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why on earth is that important? And the answer is this, that the Beatitudes, or the, the, sorry, the, the kingdom of heaven is not just about a future promise at all, is it, brothers and sisters? It's something that can be lived here and now. Jenny, have you ever, ever wondered why the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy in chapter 4 could actually say, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous judge will give me in that day. Why? The Apostle Paul lived on grace time, brothers and sisters. Practically, do you know what that means? It means that he lived as if he was in the kingdom now. That's what it means. Living by grace, living by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. For the Apostle Paul meant he lived in the kingdom now. That's why he could say there's a crown of life laid up for me. I know it. I'm in the kingdom now. I live by grace. And it doesn't matter what the the world will do. If Christ calls me, my time's finished, great. I'm there with him immediately. But if I have to endure for another 10 years, I endure. I live by his grace. Because I'm in the kingdom now. Regardless of what happens to my body. You see, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven now. You see, Christ was telling the new disciples in Matthew chapter 5, and they were new to the truth, that if they could develop the key attitudes contained in these beatitudes... There would, they would be included as part of the kingdom of heaven then and there. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, present continuous. And you see, Paul lived on grace time. He understood this principle. He lived his life as if the kingdom was already there. Because for him, it was. Because it wasn't him living anymore, it was Christ living. He had worked his way through the Beatitude journey and therefore had developed the attitude and the mind that was consistent with this Beatitude because he lived Christ today. You see, Christ had outlined the Beatitude Beatitude journey to him and he took it on the chin. Look at at how he worked. See, because what is this Beatitude journey, brothers and sisters, if it's not about how we develop the mind of Christ. You see, the Beatitude journey that Christ outlined was a lesson on growing godliness, learning how to find divine happiness and contentment in whatever might be thrown at us in our life. And the, excuse me, the Beatitudes are really a process of development. And so the Beatitudes, when you break them down in Matthew chapter 5, are a are a developing story associated with our growth in the truth. Something we have to work through each stage. And the first four stages, just like the Ten Commandments, interesting, isn't it? Reflect the development of a godly attitude and perspective in oneself. It's about developing a relationship and an understanding of God's mind and perspective in ourselves and what we do. And the next four of those Beatitudes, five, six, seven, and eight, are about actually implementing that attitude, that godly attitude and activity, to others. And so the Beatitudes, in a way, mirror the same principles as the first Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, in the the split between what, what we have to do for God and what we have to do for fellow man in the Beatitudes. But the Beatitudes really outline that progress to perfection and enhancing happiness. Otherwise known, in my words, as the happy revolution. How can we develop happiness in this life whilst we endure all that life throws at us? And just think of Saul of Tarsus, prior to his conversion for a minute, if you will. A stressed, violent arrogant zealot who was full of his own self-importance and jealous hatred and pride on a mission to prove he was right and that Gamaliel was wrong. Who once Christ had finished with him, brothers and sisters, we find a humble, a meek, 
and yet passionate man for God, who is prepared to suffer unspeakable atrocities, tortures, and persecutions, and who is able to say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, he says, I take pleasure in, or I'm happy to choose and take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For, he says, when I'm weak, that's when I'm strong. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. That's a transformation, if ever you've seen one, from Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle. And Christ took him through each stage, each key stage of growing his mind, growing the mind of Christ and growing God. And so he was taken. We don't really have the time to do the detail here tonight. But you think of the poor in spirit. He had to learn to empty himself and develop the poverty perspective. He had to then learn to need God desperately. They that mourn, the weeper's remorse. He had to learn to trust God wholeheartedly in terms of being teachable because he had to learn to become meek. He had to develop those teachable tendencies. And then finally, he had to learn to hunger and thirst after righteousness, to pursue perfection eagerly. And he had to develop those insatiable ideals for the truth. And these four stages, brothers and sisters and young people, allowed Saul to develop a close and intimate relationship with his Father in heaven. This was a God who he had once viewed as being a righteous and holy God as the law taught. But as he grew in that understanding, brothers and sisters, he also developed an understanding of his mercy and of his grace and of his forgiveness as the Psalms and the prophets expound. And he developed in himself that deep appreciation and relationship of his Father in heaven. And yet, brothers and sisters, we've already seen that God and Christ had to teach him that those emotions and that relationship had to touch his heart to convert into action so that he could develop his apostolic mission in witnessing Christ to others. And so Christ had to take him through the next four stages of his relationship so that he might learn it with others. He had to learn to provide abundant divine mercy. That's really what the merciful things are all about in verse 7. He then had to develop, so he had to be, develop forgiving friendships, brothers and sisters. He then had to learn to, um, to explore motivation and action. He had to have a pure heart. That's really what that's all about. He had to develop and explore motivation and action and pureness. He had to be hygienic in his helpfulness. And then he had to learn to seek peace as a peacemaker and developing peaceful solutions. And he had to become that passionate peacemaker to the people he came to save. And finally, in the final stage, he had to learn to position himself for harassing circumstances that he might become persecution prepared. You see, Christ took the Apostle Paul through these stages of his development to prepare him for his amazing work to be and perform as Christ's ambassador and witness as the suffering servant to those that he came to save. You see, Christ had shown him that he, uh, sorry, Christ had taught him the ability to harness eternal happiness. And by doing so, brothers and sisters, he could grow and could share with others the divine bliss of living and breathing godliness. You see, Christ had shown him that he would suffer and that by enduring these trials with patience and an attitude of godly contentment. He would be happy in the knowledge that not only was he growing godliness in himself, but he was growing the same attitude and mind of Christ in others. And do you know what, brothers and sisters? 
As a result of that, he was to become the living example of the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Have a look at this, brothers and sisters, because I think this is amazing when you stop and think about this. You want a proof that he managed to go through all of those stages? It's seen here. You see, he was going to be the living example of the salt of the earth and the light of the world. You see, the salt, the zealousness for the truth, the prophets who had gone before him had demonstrated, as Paul knew because of his reading and his knowledge, that they had a passion and a zeal for the truth that was only enhanced by what they suffered. And you see, it was because of their intense satisfaction about the word that their character and their speech and the way that they spoke about the truth seasoned the message they spoke as they endured their sufferings. And if, brothers and sisters and young people, if, if, if the prophets, as a result of persecution, had lost their faith and had buckled under pressure, they would have become good for nothing. Cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. And you see, Paul knew that, brothers and sisters. Paul knew that the secret to saltiness was to maintain his passion and zeal for that which was right. He knew that because he'd read all about them in the prophets. And so the more he endured, brothers and sisters, the more passionate he became. And the more passionate became, the more salty he became, so that that passion and that that zeal might season others, that they too might see in him the passion for the truth and might maintain their own zeal for righteousness. And, you know, have a look in, in Second of Timothy. I'll show you. Look at the message that Paul gives to Timothy in, in Second of Timothy in chapter 1. At the end of his life, the last epistle he writes, look what he says to Paul, uh, to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1. You know, no, one could, no one could accuse the Apostle Paul of not being passionate for the truth. Look what he says in verse 6. Wherefore, he says to Timothy, I put you in remembrance that you stir up the gift of God which was in thee by the putting of my, on, on of my hands. For, he says, God has not given us the spirit of fear but power and love and of a sound mind, he says. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be there a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Why? Because he saved us and he's called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Jesus Christ before the world began. But you know what, Timothy? It's now made manifest by the appearing of our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who's abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And you know why? That's why I'm appointed, verse 11, as a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. And it's because of this cause, he says, I suffer all these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which is committed unto me against that day. So here's my instruction, Timothy. You hold fast that pattern of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love, and of a sound mind. I'm sorry, faith and love, which is in Jesus Christ. You see, the Apostle Paul told Timothy, listen, son, because he calls him a son of faith, listen, son, harden up. This is what we're here for. And fire up for the truth. Become passionate. Let your saltiness rub off on others. That's why we're here. He's the salt of the earth, brothers and sisters, and the living embodiment of a passionate, zealous man for the truth. And he's the light of the world. You see, the Apostle Paul had quoted Adam for night, and when we go through the New Testament, as the light unto the Gentiles, as he quotes the servant songs. And the point about the light, brothers and sisters, is that whilst it's important to maintain the lamp in order to keep the flame alive, whilst it's important that the oil is poured into the lamp, that it might continue, the point of light is to give light to others. It's not for the light itself, is it, brothers and sisters? It's for the light for others, that others might see that light. You see, and if as a result of persecution, 
and trial, Paul had decided to hide that light. God's mercy and God's message would never have been witnessed to the ends of the earth. But it's because of his mission and because of his immense responsibility as the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ that shone in Paul, brothers and sisters, that that light of the gospel was beamed across the entire world and across the globe because of him. And that even whilst others tried on multiple tents to try and unsuccessfully extinguish that flame, the more they tried, the more he shone. And the more Paul shone, brothers and sisters, the more others began to shine with him. And that Paul realized it wasn't him shining anyway. It was Christ, the grace of God, that shone in him. Have a look in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. You see, look what he says in Philippians chapter 2 about shining your light to the world. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, he says, my beloved, Philippians 2, verse 12, as ye have also obeyed, now it is in my presence, not now is in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation for fear and trembling. For it is God which works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Therefore, he says, do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be harmless, blameless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And what are you doing? Verse 16, you're holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. You see, the light that Paul shone, brothers and sisters, was the light that lit other flames. And the light that he shone, Paul, as the, the more that Paul shone, brothers and sisters, the more he realized it wasn't him shining anyway. And you see, brothers and sisters, Christ took Paul on a journey. He took Paul on a development journey to prepare him for his work and his role as Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles. He took him from being his most antagonist adversary to becoming his most active and most passionate advocate for the truth. And he took him from being a self-centered, self-righteous, egotistical and zealous Pharisee to bring him to becoming a self-sacrificial, selfless, willing, humble apostle with a mission to spread the truth in being Christ's ambassador and a living example of the grace of God in his life. You see, he truly, brothers and sisters, is an amazing advocate and living proof of the extent of God's grace and his mercy. And a wonderful example of us to the power and the transformation that God can have in our lives if we let him. You see, no one could ever say that God can't work with us if he's able to work with Saul of Tarsus. No one can ever say that we are never we are un, we are unsavable people if he can save Paul. You see, Christ converted Saul, the murderer, and turned him into the most amazing vehicle for his grace. And if he can do that, he can do it in our lives too. And so hopefully over the course of the studies as we've experienced just how the journey that Christ took him on. Hopefully in these last few studies, brothers and sisters, we've been able to just get just a glimpse into the way in which the, the Christ worked in the life and the mind of this man who developed his righteousness to exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees as he put the principles of the truth into practice, who by doing so became a powerful weapon and tool and witness for the truth. And so the question is this. If that's the journey that he took Paul on, the question is, well, where are we in our journey? You see, we've looked at Paul, the apostle, brothers and sisters, but God's taken many men and women on this journey in the past, hasn't he? Think of Abraham and Sarah, Gideon and Samson, Moses, Rebecca, David, Solomon, Mary, Martha, Peter, James, John. In fact, 
all righteous men and women have undertaken this journey and this development. And the question is, well, where are we on our journey of faith? You know, and we are going to suffer persecution. Maybe not like Paul did, brothers and sisters, but we are going to encounter persecution. And if we haven't worked our way through the stages of those Beatitudes, brothers and sisters, we aren't living in the kingdom. We haven't fully appreciated what it means to live in grace time. And so if we are truly going to live godly, brothers and sisters, we've got to embark carefully and systematically and patiently on our journey with Christ in faith to develop his mind that we might endure with patience and happiness the persecutions that would surely come so that we might learn, as Paul did, the grace of God. So that we might understand, as Paul did, the wonder of his forgiveness. So that we might humbly seek, as Paul did, to serve one another. And so that we might comprehend, as Paul did, the need for blessing, the blessing of trial. So that we might not only suffer willingly for Christ's sake, brothers and sisters, but that in these trials we might strengthen our faith that we might harden our resolve, that we might shine more abundantly as Paul did as God's witness and ambassador to the the world. So, brothers and sisters, hopefully we've been encouraged and enthused by his remarkable example as one of Christ's greatest followers to faithfully and wholeheartedly walk with fervency and confidence towards the day of our Lord's appearing so that we with Paul might stand and say that we have fought a good fight, that we too have finished our course, and that with him we might wear our crown of righteousness.